while you're doing your bow hunting? My goodness, Michael, I've heard barks and whoops during the day because I've got too close to them in the woods, and I think they didn't want me where, wherever I was getting into because I'll follow elk for a half mile, a mile, and I got close to a big bull elk, uh, a mule deer buck, and a little sow black bear feeding in a pocket, Michael. I've never seen a concentration of animals get together and, and cohabitate like that. And when I got my little bow out and I was going to shoot the elk, about 10 yards behind me, something barked like a giant 300-pound dog, and I almost pooped my pants. And uh, I turned around, and I didn't see anything. Another thing is, my you'll be close to these things in Rocky Mountains, and you can't even hardly see them. You just kind of have to smell, or uh, you get a distinct feeling that something's not right because that feeling of something following you is valid if you're a sensitive individual. But I pressed up into a pocket of clear cut on a particular day, and I skipped lunch, and I had my bow, and I really wanted to get me a deer. I really wanted it bad, so I got into some trees, and I'm tired, and I'm clomping around, and I had walked about three miles up a closed forest trail into some steep and deep Colorado wilderness. Probably, you know, Maine's different. Colorado is really rocky and dry, and where there's water, there's life. So I got up there, and I saw a beautiful chocolate mule deer. Man, beautiful rack, and the paratrooper picks up in me, and I go chasing after him. But I realized I was tired and I was noisy, so I snuck after his tracks and I followed him maybe 800 yards. And uh, I'm following his sign. I mean, he's even pooping on the run. You know, when deer get nervous, sometimes they'll poop at a full run, which right. is great because it makes it easier to follow him. Um, anyway, I see this thing laying up about the same color. Michael, what I'm talking about is a is, is like a main chocolate brown mousse. You know, it's a distinct color. It's not quite dark black, but it has that chestnutty brown in it, and it's, it's beautiful. And I saw the same color laying on the ground behind three pine trees and a couple of quakey trees, and it was laying on its side like this, like you do when the kids sleep and it was laying, in not a fetal position, but kind of. And I thought what I did is I, I found my, my deer that had bedded down and forgot about me because it took me 45 minutes to creep up to him. And, uh, man, I put an arrow in my bow. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I pulled that son of a gun back. And I had a Gore-Tex jacket and the sound of the jacket, me pulling my arrow back. Holy smokes, man, this thing sprung up and it jumped out of them trees and it took off in a line directly opposite from the path I had traveled in. Like it was wanting to get as far away directly opposite me as it could. Holy crap. So I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking it's a black bear. And I'm looking at its ass, and it's got a big ass, and it looks like a uh, square, not like a bear that's round. This thing had a square ass, like a linebacker. You know when they get those muscles around their hips and stuff? And... Uh, it just took about three huge stretches, like a, like a greyhound dog. Because all I can remember seeing is its back legs reaching out in front of its shoulders, and then these paddle-like movements of the arms coming up and grabbing. And what it was doing was, is it was grabbing trees, and it was grabbing dirt, and it was like flinging it like this as it was running. And... Uh, I didn't know what to think. As a matter of fact, I wasn't thinking anything except that it wasn't a deer and there was no way in the world I could shoot it. Um, not because I recognized it, because it moved so fast I couldn't actually physically shoot it. Um, I wouldn't have shot it because I couldn't identify it, Michael. But I didn't see any pads on the back of the feet. When bears run, you see the, I don't know what you call them, Michael, you're a scientist, but they got those pads right here, and then they got the pads on the fingers. Yeah, I think we call them pads. <laughs> well, I must be moving up and in. <laughs> I think um, so. <laughs> but anyway, no pads. And 
Have you ever seen that footage, Michael, of the guy that scares that ape-looking thing and it runs across a clearing and it's quadrupedal and it's flapping its arms? This thing looked like that, but the one on the film, the body was upright. The one I saw, the body was parallel to the ground and it was actually reaching like a, a swimmer would do kind of a butterfly stroke. And they were offset. I noticed in the three times it reached out, that both arms couldn't come down at the same time. It had to land one arm, and then it had to land another. And then here come the feet in big sweeping movements. And it made noise like a, I mean, it just sounded like a VW bus cruising through the bush at 30 miles an hour. It gave me the impression that number one, I can break you like a twig, because every tree it touched, it broke. And uh, not tree per, per uh, main limb, but whatever it touched, Michael, it was breaking. And then I went and looked at its tracks because it took me about 10 minutes just to figure out what the hell happened and whether I should even go look. But, Mike, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm an adrenaline junkie, and it turns me on to chase shit like that around. I mean, I've got a bow, and I can shoot, and I ain't scared of nothing. So I followed this sucker in. And... I think I, I put in my report that when I looked at the front, where, where, where the front arms were landing, were like square little rectangle marks, and you could see a couple places where maybe knuckles or fingers had grabbed, but nothing concrete, all right? I couldn't even find any hair. I didn't even think to look for hair, but I followed this thing, and what it did is it ran straight up the side of a mountain, up into some rocks, up in a... Uh, you would call it a ridge, and I physically couldn't follow it. I was physically exhausted at that point and shaky and kind of freaked out. But, Michael, if me and you, I know you got experience in the bush. I saw what you'd done on Discovery Channel down in South America. And me being a paratrooper and is it growing up in the Rocky Mountains, me and you couldn't have gone after this thing and found it in a day. We couldn't. They're that fast. They're that. Uh, the endurance on these is amazing. Michael, how big so, do you think this creature was? I mean, it was running. You know, uh, it, it was always on all fours. Apparently, how big do you think it was at high at the shoulder? And you know, what do you think maybe the weight of it was? I think if 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 you looked at it in linear feet, because I'm a carpenter, I think it would be five feet or less, maybe six. And it wasn't very big. It might have been two hundred. 220 pounds, maybe less than 200 pounds, but it was powerful. You know, like any animal in the wild, they have a strength ratio that is not comparable to humans. So, but, but the power of it was amazing. And I'm pretty familiar with black bears. And if it would be anything that me and you could sit down and say, well, what could it have been, Mike? Well, it could have been a black bear, but it's not like the, the general shape, demeanor, run smell tracks were not a black bear now um, you say you smell so, you you smelt it michael yeah man, i can smell a herd of mule deer a half mile away and people that know me can verify that but they it smelled like uh smells like when an elk pisses all over itself smell no different than an elk to me it smelled no different it's got that musty pissy odor about it and Here's another thing, Mike, you know this, you spend a week or two out in the woods like we have it, you get to smell on things real good. You know, you clear out a, you're in the bush after a week, you lose all that crap in your sinuses <laughs> and you can smell like a beast, you know, but part of being a good bow hunter, Mike, you know, is you have to get close and shoot straight. And so that's what I've become good at. And I, I was purposely trying to kick something out of the woods but I kind of didn't expect that much commotion. Even a bull elk wouldn't make that much commotion. Now, uh, Mike, unless when you're bow when you're bow hunting like that, what type of uh, gear do you have on? And like, do you use cover sense? What type of uh, you know attractants or cover sense might you use? Um, well, you know, I pretty much go in your standard Walmart camouflage fatigues um, and war paint it up. And what I'll do is. Uh, I'll get some fresh elk sign as far as elk poop and 
I'll go to an elk wallow that uh, is in the area and I'll wipe the mud all over me. Um, basically, man, you know, I become one with my environment because that's what gives me a thrill and I enjoy it. So the dirtier and stinkier I get, uh, the more successful I feel I'm going to be in the field. Now, this was yeah. the first encounter you had had with one of these creatures. What happened, uh, you know, I mean, after you had that encounter, what, what's... What's been going on recently? I mean, we, how did you progress? Well, you know, that would have been actually my third sighting of a Sasquatch. Um, but what's been going on recently is... Well, no, tell us about the other two. I didn't know you had two, two prior to that one, Mike. Oh, man, I had one that was nearly a five-and-a-half-hour encounter in uh, Pinnacle Trail, Alaska, and that's what got me interested in Bigfoot. And uh, my wife nearly sent me to the damn psychologist over that one. Um, I shot at it. Uh, it, it I, I don't think I was more than uh, 25 yards away from this thing grunting and hollering and spitting and uh, roaring. And, uh, well, what happened is I'm an idiot. First of all, <laughs> because I'll, I'll take an ATV and my dog... <clears throat> And I'll see a nice trail on the map in Alaska, and I'll take my happy ass down it. And I went down a trail, and it took me three days by four-wheeler before I stopped, and I camped. And I camped on a beaver pond, the intersection of five game trails, and uh, a slope to, uh, I think it's uh, the Chitna River. Well, anyway, I'll get you the, the specifics on it, Michael, but... Um, I woke up at three in the morning to my 200 pound Malamute sitting on my chest through the tent and he was growling. And I thought we had a grizzly bear problem. You know, Mike, we, you know, up there, I'm ready for a grizzly bear. So I grabbed my ranch rifle and I was scared because I could hear growling. Mike, I could hear my dog growling. And then it's like this ultra low, basal, primal, like, if you're a combat soldier, it's the kind of growl that you would just send chills in you, but it, it's low, it, almost lower than you, you could feel it. It's like when an airplane vibrates the engines and you're just like, you know, but something that maybe weighed a thousand pounds doing that. All right. So I get out of the tent and my dog is, he, he won't even let me walk. And uh, Moose is 200-pound Maluk Malamute, native to Alaska. So I'm looking at what's growling at us. And it's behind a big spruce tree. These spruce trees are beautiful. They're like 60, 70 feet tall, 40 foot wide at the bottom. And you could almost teepee underneath the umbrella of it. And that's where it was. And it was underneath the umbrella of this spruce tree. And it was hollering at my dog. And... I, I, it hated my dog. I just got the distinct feeling it was after my dog and him and the dog were growling each other. So uh, my first thought is, is I've got a bushman, okay? Because sometimes in Alaska when you camp, you can get wild bushmen who will steal your four-wheeler or steal your gear. Uh, they're known to be around mining camps and take advantage of when you leave your equipment out. Um, so there are rogue people out in the woods that do weird things. But here's the deal, man, is I said, hey, if you don't quit screwing around, I said, I'm scared to death. And I said, if you don't leave me alone, I'm going to shoot you. So I rack up my ranch rifle, and this thing's growling, and then it's a bang, all these branches snap. And my dog, he whimpered, and he actually got his 200-pound ass underneath my four-wheeler and wouldn't come out. And I'm standing there, and I, I think I kind of peed my pants. And... Uh, this thing did like a monkey. It got out from under the tree and it went side to side like this, stomping and hooting, just like a monkey. Ooh, ooh. And I am tripping. I'm tripping. I have never been so scared in my life. Uh, 63 combat equipment jumps, 40 of them at night. And I've never had fear like that. I actually couldn't breathe. I, I couldn't move, and it circled around me, and it scared me when it circled me because I'm thinking it's flanking me, it's screwing with me, it, it's playing tactical games with me, 
and I just threatened to shoot him. And so I squeezed up like, I could see Mike, it looked like a refrigerator, tilted over at about a 30 degree angle and just swing and, and move and real fast. But the body movement's slow because it's so big. I'm thinking 1,200 pounds, 12 feet tall. And when it was chattering at me, before it ran off, I was looking at its chest and didn't until I saw it in the silhouette see that its head was four feet taller than I was even thinking where its head should be. So that's how big it was. And uh, then it went to a group of pine trees about, okay, this is where it gets creepy, about 25 feet right behind our fire pit was a group of trees and it's just hanging out there and it's breaking branches. And I think I went into a little bit of a shock because after I shot it, my ears were ringing, the dog's ears were ringing, and it took about 10 minutes for me to mellow out and be able to hear again, and the freaking thing hadn't moved. It, the, the, the 762 by 39 passing right over its head did not get it to, to leave me alone. And, um, so you weren't shooting to kill it. You were just shooting a warning shot over its head just to, for it to get out of there, right? Yeah, Michael, because I thought it might be a wild, like I said, a bushman. You know, sometimes you get these crazy son of bitches that are out there, and they'll they'll roll a big hunting party, brother. What they'll do is they'll wait till you go out and drink and get drunk. They'll come in and steal your hunting gear, and away they go. Yeah, but they're not 1,200 pounds. No, sir, and they're not. 33 miles into the interior of Alaska, like I was on a four-wheeler. Um, I was on an old gold mining trail is what it was, Mike. I was gold mining. That's what I was doing, Mike. I had no freaking interest in Bigfoot at that point. I'd never even really considered it. And uh, that's why I didn't shoot it, because it didn't categorize in my mind as an animal that I could quantify as being, I'm a Christian can't just uh, shoot things, man. Um, and I thought it might have been a man. I really do. I still to this day think it could have been. Uh, my whole view on these damn things is they're 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 half ancient man and they're they're half pure animal. And uh, I, uh, Mike, all right, I shot at it twice. It didn't leave me alone after my ears cleared out. Uh, it's back there breaking branches and you can hear it stomping and growling. And it would chatter its teeth. It just, it was just that was just too much. And and that's when I could see its silhouette, the head, and I put like six rounds right here. Boom, 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 boom. Then, then the thing freaked out. Then it tore up everything. It could get its. It just tore every every tree and screaming and yelling. And it took off running like a man at, at an angle like that. And it ran about a half mile. I got a picture I will show you of the camp I took the night this happened. Quarter mile down to the beaver ponds, splashed all the way across. It didn't run around the beaver pond, brother. It ran through the beaver pond. And it sounded like the Denver Bronco football team uh, running, doing aquatic aerobics, dude. It was crazy. And then it, it got out of the water, and, and I can show you pictures, ran straight the side up of a pass, about 1,000 vertical feet at about an angle like that, down into the big river basin. And the big river basin is no man's land. I couldn't cross it on a four-wheeler. It, um, it is bush country where you fly in by plane. So... And, 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 you know, even now, I don't know what to tell you about that. I, I don't know what to tell you. Maybe I should have shot the damn thing. So, uh, you know what? I actually think I, I, I might have should have shot the damn thing. So I knew what the hell it was because we, we would probably have. That's the big crux, Michael, is when you see him, you don't know whether to shoot it or not. That's the, that's, that's the weird thing about it. Yeah, other people have reported that too, Michael. You know? You still there, Mike? Still there, Mike? Yeah, buddy, I'm here. 
Yeah, other people have reported, you know, looking at these things through a scope and, you know, they either can't figure out what it is or it looks so human. I don't know, boy, if something was 12 feet tall, that, that, sounds, <laughs> that sounds terrifying. Um, it was a year before I went back out into the woods. It was a full year. And I, I, okay, the only reason I didn't consult a psychologist is because I came to terms that it does exist. And when I came to terms with it does exist, I, I don't care what people say because, Michael, here's the deal with me. I'm a real hard bastard to get along with, man, and I don't have many friends on my Facebook page because my view is, is until you have walked a mile in my shoes and spent as many years in the bush as I have, I don't care for your opinion because you weren't there. And, and that has led me down a very lonely road, but I'm the kind of guy that can take somebody out and show them at least evidence because these creatures are not mystical. They're not interdimensional. I could shoot one right in the balls this summer if that's what the drive or focus of a mission was. If you had SEAL Team 6, or a bunch of hungry paratroopers, you could haul a Bigfoot off a mountain quickly. Why they don't do it, Michael, I don't know. But you see a lot of activity with the Bureau of Land Management, Department of Interior, up in our mountains in these areas. Michael, who knows what they're doing with them? I mean, who knows what sort of interaction our federal government is having with these animals. But I know there's something going on. Colorado's not that large you can't figure shit out so you think the government knows about the sasquatch some people think there's a conspiracy that the government you know is keeping them under wraps you know if they're keeping them under wraps it's only to serve the purpose of not scaring everybody out of the woods and you know maybe maybe they're trying to man my my thought on that michael would be some sort of limited management some sort of limited husbandry animal husbandry if you think about what the department of agriculture is scoped to do it is in essence to provide some sort of management for natural resources maybe they look at bigfoot as just an animal commodity that has to be my sincere impression is separated from the public there is a reason these freaking things don't hang out with us and have dinner with us because they might eat your kid. Right. You know? But, Michael, don't you think that, you know, if the government knew about that, that that would leak out, you know, game wardens and biologists and stuff would well, tell somebody? Well, it does leak out, Michael, but, you know, when you get to the point in your investigations like I do, you see everything and believe nothing. I mean, I only believe what I see going on in Colorado. And I have spent so many years in certain areas that I probably know as much about them as the rangers that work them. And what I see is areas of high Sasquatch activity that I have documented on CBIG through photos, however half-assed they may be, you know, I'm just a punk. I'm an outdoorsman. I'm not a, a researcher per se. But... I'm trying to show people that there's something going on out there. Tell me there's not, Mike. You know? Well, no, you've shown me well, some interesting footprints that you've collected out there, Michael, that are, you know, puzzling the footprints. They puzzle me, man. Now, what was your other sighting, Michael? You've told us about two of them. You said you had a third sighting? Yeah, this one was in, um, I'll even tell you, I'll give you a general location for this one because it's frequented by a lot of people. It's Gould, Colorado. Up Highway, um, I think it's Highway uh, 14, I don't know, but Pooter Canyon, Cameron Pass, um, those are some good areas. And I was bow hunting again, and what I did is I found a huge section of meadow that was in between some closed forest roads. And by the way, most Sasquatch sightings I have are in between closed forest roads. So that's part of the assumption that the Forest Service works with these animals to limit their potential uh, exposure. Uh, so I had hunted the same area for five days, walking it slowly, not seeing anything for five days. 
And the last day I'm out there and it's beautiful and I wanted to sit down and have lunch. So I sat down and put my bow down and I'm looking out at this meadow about 60 yards in front of me and some aspen trees. You're going to like this one, Mike. <laughs> and I think I'm looking at a bull moose. And I love bull moose. They're entertaining to me. I've even in the past liked to see how close I can get to them before I disturb them so I know, you know, how, how hunting works, how close I can get to these things before they figure me out. So that's what my dumbass proceeded to do. And I kind of snuck up on the edge of the meadow and I got to where I could see it in the interior of the meadow. And it looked like it was laying down on, you know how animals lay like this on the ground, and like a cat would lay down. And I thought that's kind of strange for a moose to do because you know, if a predator gets it's hard for him to raise up and get out of there. Moose do bed down, right, Mike? But that they're very comfortable when they bed down. They don't right. bed down when things are shaking around. So I'm watching it, and I thought, man, that's a beautiful big moose. And I pop open my water in a candy bar, and this thing raised up off the ground, and it didn't have skinny legs. What it had is two great big legs, and the, the, the legs on this thing would probably be, you know, um, um, as big as my waist, maybe bigger. I'm only 150 pounds, but the legs would have been legs that weighed a couple hundred pounds a piece. I mean, that's how big the legs were. And I, I, I am tripping. And um, I knew, I knew this was the only time I knew I was seeing a Sasquatch at that point. The other times I didn't know what the hell was going on till later. But this, I was like, holy cow, man, I'm actually watching this happen. And it's daytime, 12 o'clock, 1230, 70 degrees, beautiful day. And it raises up and it's got three inch long hair. It's just that, yeah, that long. And it's beautifully groomed, no smell. I'm downwind to this thing, no smell. This was the cleanest animal I had ever seen. It had jet black hair, the most beautiful jet black. It wasn't quite fur because fur would in, entail to me that it had some sort of fuzziness or uh, thermal property to it. This was almost like just a protective layer of fur like an elk would have in summer coat. Um, it was jet black and it had the, the muscles on the side. I could see, God, did it have a hump in its back. It looked like it had a broken back right here, because when it was bending over like this, I saw the hump, and I thought, well, it's not very tall. It would be six or six, seven feet tall. And then it straightened out this hump to reach up in the quakies, and it got to be eight. It gave it another foot of length. So what I'm saying is when this thing goes over parallel like this and bends its back, it gives it a different look to it than any other animal I've ever seen. It like... Uh, it didn't morph interdimensionally, but it has the ability with this articulation in its back or the muscles in it to kind of roll its shoulders over and package itself up into a little ball type of thing. And then when it laid up, and then what it did is I saw the arm. The arm wasn't extremely muscular, but it was thick. It was just thick. And then it tapered off really beautifully thin, and it had really long fingers. And they were elegant, and they were supple, and they had black skin, and it had black nails, and it had, I don't know if they were pads, but like when a carpenter works, you get these big patty things on your fingers. It had like really hard worked fingers. And then what it did is it reached up, and it had its face about eight feet high, and it, Mike, if it was doing anything, if it knew I was, it was there, it was hiding its head because I could only see the back of its neck and shoulders down. And then it reached up to the quaky branch and pulled all the leaves, just zipped it down like an elephant. And it stuck it in his mouth and it ate him. Wow. And it did that about four or five times. And then I got a sickening feeling in my belly to get the hell out of there. A sickening feeling, like I, I just about cute and uh maybe the shock or the awe i was in awe 
this thing was, uh, I would estimate it to be eight feet tall, six or 700 pounds. And I thought my bow would kill it. My bow would kill it and kill it. But I knew I was looking at Bigfoot. I mean, it looks like a Bigfoot. It's got a coconut shape to the back. It's just round, and that's all I saw. I wish I would have saw its face. But if the face looks anything like, you know, the skin, it has skin on its hands. So I just wonder if it had skin on its face. That's the only thing I wonder about to this day, Michael, is if they have skin on their faces. I don't know that. Now, how long was the um, hair on the back of the head, Michael? Mike, it seemed like this stuff was pretty uniform in length. It, uh, you know, it might have had a little flagging of hair under the forearms is all I remember. Because I was really watching it reach. It, God, it was beautiful, just long and just gentle pulling. So I'm watching the forearms, and uh, I was captivated by its wrist and hand. It was just elegant for the power it had. Now, when you call them quakies, that's a, like a type of, that's an aspen, right, type of poplar? Yes, Don't sir. You? Yeah. Uh, as far as I can tell you, we just call them quakies in Colorado. Now, the beavers like to uh, eat the bark on them, right? Yeah, and you'll find a lot of the beaver ponds built out of them, Mike, you know. Uh, they'll take them down, and they, they seem to, you know, Another thing is, is uh, now that I think about it, uh, quite a, two of the three encounters I've had were either beaver ponds or ponds next to the siding mine. Just like you're saying about water, I think maybe you're right about fish, but I found in the Rocky Mountains here, uh, up the Cooter Canyon, Michael, in a ravine, a very steep sloped ravine with a very, very unforgiving grade where six elk were funneled down it and at the bottom of the ravine, Michael, was a tree that was laid across and some rocks and six elk piled up on that thing with all broken legs and broken necks like the old Indians used to do, how they'd funnel animals into an area and just put the whack on them, brother. So I'm looking at these things, and two of them had broken legs and one had a broken neck, and then they had rips in their bellies right here where the liver was taken out of them. Now the racks are on them, Michael. And all the meat is good. Michael, these are fresh elk. This is December. There are six of them piled in a heap at the bottom of a gully. Michael, that is the scariest thing I'd seen, man. I got my ass out of there. You have to cross the Poudre River by foot and then walk up a valley. I go where nobody goes. I honestly go where no people go. And when you do that, you see some strange shit. But that... That looked to me like a food cache. I'm going to put that out there. I think they cache food. Now, Michael, you said they took the, the livers out. What do you think, how, how, were the, you know, how were the bodies opened up? I mean, how did they get into the abdomen? Shit, Mike, it looked like if you took a stick, <laughs> gouged, ripped. Mike, you know as a hunter, when a dead animal is freshly killed, flesh rips pretty easily. You know, you know it, it really does. If you get into a back strap or a loin or a rope on a freshly killed deer, you can peel it from the fascia around it. And once you penetrate that elk hide, it looked to me like it was ripped, Michael. Now, I were there were there it. bite marks or any other damage anywhere else on the elk body? It just looked body? like if you took a package of feed and ripped it, you know, it looked like the skin was crumpled where it had been, like, grabbed. You know, where you grab something and pry it open. And the neck the neck broken was, was freaky because one one head was broken and then turned all the way around. And, and that could have been from falling down the gully. But it just was gruesome. And I had never seen anything like that. And this, Michael, here's the funny thing. When you saw my snow tracks and you said, Mike, why didn't you follow them? They went up over a mountain that leads down into that damn ravine. So everything I find, Michael, I'm trying to put it together. It's proximal locations that I'm stringing together occurrences and evidence. And it, it, there's undeniable activity in the Poudre Canyon in Colorado. Undeniable. 
And, was uh, there anything else that had fed upon these did elk, though, no, Michael? Oh, man, nothing. See, that's what gave me the spooks, okay? You know we have mountain lion and black bear. Mountain lions are darn opportunistic, and so are black bears. Not even as much as a vulture, or not a vulture, we would have ravens. No ravens, no magpies, no nothing. Very quiet. You know, that whole, ooh, it's spooky. <laughs> yeah. All right? Mm. Well, I've run into that a couple times. There's something to that, brother. You know, if you're freaking paying attention, um, like my dad says, we're lifelong Coloradoans. You don't walk a mile in the woods out here in the bush without a bear or mountain lion following you or watching your action. So that's just how high a density of animals we've got up here. But nothing fed on it. And I would imagine they were dead two weeks. I know dead critters. I kill them. Two weeks, you know, laying there. December. So, you know, it didn't rot. Everything was fresh. And all the elk and had their livers removed. Mike, I could only see two, man, because they were piled on each other, and I, could, I, I couldn't pry them apart. They were giant, you know? Yeah. They're, they're big, you know. Uh, these are just things I've experienced, man, you know? And, and, and I'm not a scientist. I'm more of a... I don't even know if I'm a tracker, Mike. I'm an enthusiast. I'm a hunter. Oh, you sound like a tracker to me, Mike. If you're bow hunting and you're getting things with a bow and arrow, you're... You know, you're definitely tracking stuff. But, you know, that's the extent of it. Uh, to go into any more, you know, embellishment, there's no embellishment. I have a hard time lying. It's not in my nature. I mean, everybody at church knows who I am and what I do. So I got to, I'm on a pretty tight line with, with reality. And I think that's what makes it so hard for me to get along with folks is because I just can't buy into a lot of this stuff that's going on. Oh, Mike, I have the same problem. <laughs> well, Michael, I want to, I want to, uh, I'm going to wrap.